Thanks for having us. I'm Karen with Co2, and I'm here today with Cristobal from Runway and Shane from Jasper. So I'm just going to ask these guys to quickly introduce themselves. What are you? What is? What does Jasper do, and how did you get into this? Right, the first test. Uh, AI will do that for me one day. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Shane Orlick. I'm the president at Jasper. Uh, I've been at Jasper for about a year and a half. Um, and what draw me, drew me into Jasper was just seeing the magic the first time I went in and tried to create content and got this amazing answer back. And you know, um, just the power and like technology became fun again in that moment when I saw it. And I have been in tech for a while doing enterprise software and kind of traditional sort of boring things for a long time and I got that spark back and from there I was just hooked. Uh, Jasper, in case uh, you don't know, we are a content platform that people use for work and our whole goal in life is to make creative people more creative. So our goal is to like that pit in your stomach when you have uh, to do an assignment or be creative spontaneously or you know just get started on a project, we want to eliminate that pit and get you, you know, 60, 70 percent of the way there, so that you can spend your time, your energy, your focus on the magic that goes on top of, uh, of making that content creative. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Of all, hi everyone. My name is Chris. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Runway. Um, we're a company that does research and products for creatives and the next generation of uh, storytellers work a lot with filmmakers, with designers, with artists, um, and we build our own models and our own products. Okay, so we spent a big part of today talking about the moment that we're in. We're in a real moment in time. So I wanna ask about moats. How do you have a moat in this moment? And the reason I think it's particularly interesting for the two of you is you've, you have real products, that real people use, and you've been doing it for a while. I mean, a while in AI terms is its own thing. But um, first to you, Shane, how do I think about a moat and a differentiator for, for what you're doing? Yeah, it, I think that's like such a great question. I think everyone's probably wondering the same thing. Um, so I'll go back a little bit into Jasper's life cycle. We've been around for almost two and a half years. So we had sort of this two-year pre-chat GPT period, and then you know four, five, six months, I guess November 30th, we could do the math, um, post-chat GPT world that we're in. Um, so when we started two and a half years ago, we were a wrapper on top of OpenAI. We were able to leverage G uh, chat G or GPT-3 at the time, and then basically just use that to create really cool content. And what happened is our customers started pulling us into different directions. And so I think the biggest advice that I'd have for everybody on when you're thinking about this moat is pick something that's authentic. Pick something you really care about, that you know about, and build something for yourself. Because those are the people that are ultimately going to use your product and love it. And so for us, like we were marketers. We were go-to-market people. Like That's who we built Jasper Jarvis at the time for. Where, you know, we we kind of started it off by accident because our previous founders were just trying to create content better for another startup they had called Proof. And all of a sudden, that became the business. That became this tool that all their friends wanted to use. And then a community grew around it. And all of a sudden, people started bringing us into work with them. And from there, I think that's when we quickly realized that we couldn't just be a wrapper on OpenAI or on any model. One, it's just not that interesting. And two, there's probably a ton of... Uh, room to get disrupted. And so that's when we started really listening to our customers and our customers were telling us like they didn't want generic content anymore. That content had to be br on brand, on message. It had to know about them. They needed multiple versions of that content. It had to be, you know, in their brand tone. It had to be long form. So they started telling us what they needed. And then we quickly figured out, okay, we actually need multiple models for that. And we started partnering up with you know, all the other model providers. And that's sort of how we have now put ourselves into such a great position for this sort of post chat GPT world. But find something that you're passionate about, that you care about, and that you can really picture your company in three years, five years, 10 years still doing. Um, and I think if you do that, you'll be in good shape. So Chris, I don't know if people know this. I'm gonna say it like, you're an artist. You actually went to art school. This is not, it's such an, this, 
artist meets research meets science meets. Uh, so I'd love people to understand too, like where you came from, which I think is incredibly important as you're building what you're building and for who you're building it for. Yeah, happy to share more about, I guess, the journey. Um, funny enough, I was looking at one of my first projects ever. Um, one of your first what? One of my first art projects ever was actually a text-to-video tool that I created like 12 years ago. So I guess full circle now with Gen 1 and Gen 2. Um, so I started building Runway as a research project inside art school, actually. Um, I was really interested in, at the time was uh, very early, uh, 2016, 2015 uh, research on the space. Um, Deep Dream was around, and that that whole like model and research and images that were coming out of that just captivated my attention, my curiosity. And so, spent a lot of time building tools. And I quickly realized I'm I, I don't consider myself an artist. I think I'm more of myself of my art is tool making. I like to build tools for artists. Um, and that has, I guess, provided us, and, and the, the three founders were three founders. We all met at art school while building this research tool. Was tools. this art school in New York? In New York, yeah, okay. NYU. Um, it's media arts, so it's like the intersection of like art and technology. And I think that that was like six years ago. We started Runway four years ago, and we've always thought about really taking this new paradigm of computation and providing creatives in different domains with new tools. These are fundamentally new tools. I think someone was comparing them to a transistor. I think this is very similar, and, and for artists, perhaps it's as similar as the camera. We're inventing a new camera. And the moment you have a new camera, you have to really think about every possible thing that can be built on top of that, including cinema. Um, and so we're, we're at the stages of realizing that this is a fundamental piece of technology that will change how we tell stories, and we need a new piece of like interface to use that. And, and so that has, I think, really informed how we think about research fundamentally. We're building foundational models from, from some time now, but also how we think about giving this to more, to more people. Um, that's, that's, I guess, I don't know if that's a mode, but that's, that's the way we know how to operate. I think every company is different, uh, and that's the way we've been iterating over for, for some time now. So you both have brought this up, foundational models, to build or not to build your own. Shane, it seems like you've decided to build on other foundation models, and, and Chris, it seems like you've decided to build your own. Is that fair? Is that an overgeneralization? How do you think about this? Who wants to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, I think every company is different. I think every company has a different set of like uh, opportunities. I think for us, I've been, I've been working on this for a big chunk of the last decade, and and now is runway is going to turn five years, and so we really think about if we want to really deliver something as powerful and as magical as we think this will be, then we need to own everything. We need to be able to control every aspect of this technology and make sure that we can iterate really fast. So we've, we we like to think of runway as a full stack company. We build the core research and the core architectures for for these kind of models. But we also build the infrastructure. A lot of the problems in, in the space right now is how do you get this to billions of users? Because we've never, we've never been able to run this at scale because most of these things didn't exist that, like a couple of years ago. And so being able to deliver on that really matters. I think one of the hardest things right now is to actually build products because things are moving so fast that if you commit yourself to something for too long, you might actually become obsolete really fast. Um, and I think for us that that kind of like model where you where you have full visibility and ownership of every stack um, hasn't been easy because you need to really excel at every single aspect of that. But once you do it, you have full control and full visibility and do anything and you can change anything you want. I think that for us has been kind of like more more interesting and powerful to do. Yeah, I think that's great. I think um, our success happened really quickly. You know, we launched and all of a sudden we went from you know, we've sort of talked about some of the numbers publicly, but you know, we were adding thousands of customers every day and we were really just focused on making sure that our customers were getting the best experience. What is different about Jasper, our customers are all paying customers. So we don't really have a freemium offering. We're actually coming out with a freemium offering, but our customers were paying us every month. And if we didn't deliver value to those customers every single month, they're not gonna stay with us for the next month. 
And so for us, it was really simple. We were focused so much on that customer experience and there were great partners out there that could really support any sort of use case that our customers were bringing us into. So OpenAI was a great partner for us. We would get into enterprises that wanted to have their own private models and we could go to Cohere or now constitutional models, we could go to Anthropic. Um, we were also getting a lot of the providers, the Googles of the world that were coming out with their own models were trying to get us to test their models. We've built this AI engine that can plug and play, uh, plug in different models into our engine and then spit out the right piece of output based on the, the best model. Um, we have also stability. Ahmad, if he's still here, is, is fantastic. We wanted to launch images as quickly as we possibly could. Ahmad had an API to us within 24 hours and we had launched on that Monday. Our customers were asking us for images alongside the stories that they're telling and videos, same thing. Um, so we were able to you know, kind of move quicker than we would have otherwise. We also do have our own models though. They're not large language models, they're actually smaller models that are finely tuned to support different use cases. So we have retailers that want to do product descriptions and they want to help their teams do that. Our smaller models that are finely tuned actually perform really well for that function. And so we're able to use our own models for that. So for us, it wasn't as binary as like build our own or use partners and our partner ecosystem is so incredible. And like the second chat GPT comes out, we can put that into our product. The second our technology partners are coming out with really cool things in their models, it's instantly available to our customers, which is ultimately what we care about pros and cons. And it's interesting that you went, started as paid and are moving to free. That's a, not, that's sort of a thing that most companies sort of don't go in that direction. And we have had so many debates back and forth on this. Um, we're not going to give the whole product away for free. We're going to give them a little bit of a taste. Uh, something that's more in line with what you could get from ChatGPT, uh, you know, text box where you can enter uh, you know, a question or a, a query and you'll get back uh, your answers. But if you actually want to use the power of Jasper and have multiple versions in your own brand tone that remember what you've been talking about and that are collaborative and secure, that's when you would use our paid version. Um, so that's how we're focused on this. Okay. So when I think of Runway, I think of the number seven a lot. I oh, know, I know, the number seven. So seven in this context is a team of seven people from the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once won seven Academy Awards. Is that about right? For uh, amazing art, film, and story, and really leveraged runway. So it was a, yeah, I really enjoyed that movie. <laughs> um, so it was such a cool mainstream moment of like, wait a second, this is possible in the right hands of storytellers that, you know, just n very little budget and what they could do. So when you think about this, and as, as we think about it, you've, you've announced Gen 1 and Gen 2. Can you tell people what that is? And then when I think about the tools that creatives like, the every, 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 um, how do I think about that? Because it did blow my mind that, that such a small team could then do so much. Yeah, I think that's a sign of the times in terms of how powerful these technologies are and, and how far you can get with just talent and good ideas. Um, and tools are ways of executing those ideas. There's still like a long way to go to make it even more accessible. I think our goal is to get that to one. One person should be able to do um, the work that perhaps hundreds of people are doing on, on, on for example, VS, VFX um, these days. Um, I think on, on, on Gen 1 and Gen 2... Um, these Remind are people what it is. Yeah, so uh, Gen 1 and Gen 2 represent a new uh, set of uh, foundational models for video generation. Uh, these models are able to generate consistently and temporarily coherent video using different input mechanisms. So you can generate video using just text. You can just like, like I'm sure you've seen image, uh, text to image, you can do now text to video. Uh, you can also drive and generate video using existing video, which is a new technique. And this approach comes from our, I guess, understanding and knowledge and empathy of working with artists like the folks behind Everything Every Other Ones, where we understand that these are not tools that go from zero to one with no human control. These are tools that require consistent feedback loops. And so video to video represents for us that, that kind of like approach where 
you can drive a generation process inputting or using any video source that you have. And the amount of creativity that's born out of that is just so, so incredibly fascinating to see. And so Gen Wild was released um, actually on Monday, if you all want to try it out. Um, it's, <laughs> it's moving fast. And then Gen 2 was announced uh, a few days after, and we'll release Gen 2, which is the next improvement on the quality and also the input mechanism, including text to video, over the next couple of weeks. But yeah, it's been, it's been exciting. We just go every day into Twitter and Instagram, and now LinkedIn has become. Yeah, the uh, stuff they're making. And just search for Gen 1, it's like, wow, blows my mind. Yeah. Are you sharing any numbers? What, sir? Are you sharing any numbers, which I um, <laughs> uh, There's a lot. We, we have millions of customers, and, and everyone is like, really excited about like, what Gen 1 represents. And, and to be clear, like, Gen 1 is also it's only the beginning of like, the, 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 the representation of the amount of work, and the progress will, will, will come soon on, on the family of video models and multi-model systems in general. Yeah, it's really. When you guys are thinking about it, I'm going to change. Um, when you think about big tech right now, specifically, let's think about some of the cloud providers. And you think about what you're building and the relationship there. How do you think about what happens with big tech and the cloud providers? What your role is there? I know, Chris, you have a relationship with Amazon that you recently announced. How, do, how are you all thinking about that? And how should we think about them? Yeah. Um, so. It's an interesting question. I think it's one we're all trying to figure out. And I think it's mostly just how do you not get stepped on accidentally? I'm, I'm not really too worried about them coming up with a Jasper that's better than us, because that's all we think about all day, every single day, is how to make the experience better for our customers. So I don't really worry about them coming up with Jasper. I, I worry about us working on something for three months that somebody accident that just releases that we could have just leveraged, and we could have been working on something else for those three months. So for us, it's really around tight partnerships. We're talking to like everybody at Google, everyone at Microsoft. Uh, you know, we're trying to understand their roadmap. They're trying to understand their roadmap, and we're actually able to help them because a lot of the stuff they're coming out with is pretty generic. You know, AI that we were working with two years ago. It's better now, but it's the same idea. Like people don't know how to use it. They don't know the best. Uh, you know, the best way to interact with it, and we're able to help and coach. So it's staying really close to them. And, and so I think this is a lot like autonomous vehicles, right? The last 10% is 90%, at least in our world, where if we can focus on making sure that that experience is better, like Microsoft's a big customer of ours. Uh, Google's a customer of ours. We're working with their marketing organizations internally to help them do better marketing. Um, that's very different than launching AI in their product in a press release and you know, telling the world about it. Um, and so that's been our approach is like keep them close and they want to be close and, you know, come to all these events and just try to stay, uh, you know, up on the trends, but not over index and not get too, uh, you know, it's really easy in this world to read something today. It was the letter last week. It was plugins in ChatGPT. Like there's all kinds of different shiny keys that uh, we see every single day. So for us, it's just being focused on that North Star and making sure that we're close with, uh, you know, with all the partners. Chris, I know you always talk about like build, 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 build. <laughs> Stay focused, build, build, yeah, build. I this think is, you talked to Chris for two seconds. He's like, I got to go build. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I need to go build. Um, <laughs> Thank you for being here. Gotta go. I think, uh, I think, again, every company is different. Every company has different like opportunities. I think for us, uh, owning that stack has been really important and working at, at the lowest level possible needs to surface back to the top in some way in, in the product. And so we found incredible partners along the way. Um, and so we're really happy to be able to partner with, with, yeah, with AWS, but also with NVIDIA, uh, who've been also incredible partners in accelerating this. This is, there's challenges in the training side of things, but also in the inference side of things that, that um, specifically for video, we're like n still very early on infrastructure. And so I'm also looking for partners that can help us build more faster on the infrastructure side. So if anyone has ideas. So when you both started out, you had a really clear idea of who your customer was, which I think a lot of companies starting out right now are like, well, we don't know, we're gonna see, but you had, we're gonna go for people who are marketing, who are creating content. Is that fair? And Chris, you were like, it's for creators, video creators, and then we're gonna change the format so it's 
like a camera, not like anything seen before. How important is it and how important was it to you to have that clear sense of who it is you're building for? Yeah, I think it's everything. Um, you know, I was just talking, Taylor, told you I'd give you a shout out today, you know, building AI for architects and not like general people trying to be architects, but architects using AI in their everyday life. Like, you know who that customer is. You know what their life is like. You know what keeps that person up at night and what they're complaining about to their significant other at home. Like, if you know what that problem is and you're focused on solving that problem, no one else is gonna catch you. If you're trying to build something generic and you could build it in a week, I promise you there's a team out there that could build it in four days and they're probably going to. And if you're not really passionate about that problem that you're solving, um, you know, I, I think you're ripe for disruption. And, uh, you know, make sure you pick a large enough TAM that, you know, once you build that solution, you know, enough people can use it. But I think if you do that, you'll be in good shape and no one else is gonna do that. And if they are, they're six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months away, because everyone's trying to chase the easy app right now. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, the biggest thing. If you can't imagine that person's name, we actually have like, you know, we actually name our personas, right? And if you can't actually visualize that person, then I think you're in trouble, especially with how fast everything's moving in AI. Sorry, Taylor, what was your company? I forgot. Corbu. Corbu, there you go. AI for architects. And I do love what you're talking about with the community. That is the most magical thing about AI is like everyone's trying to help each other and everyone's genuinely excited about the projects that we're working on and um, you know, has great ideas. Yeah, um, so the question was, how do you think about users and yeah, personas? you had this vision for creators. You were like, I'm building for, I guess, who you were. Well, I think, first of all, if I think about creators or creatives, I think about creativity, and I think creativity is a state of mind. Everyone can be creative. I think we tend to associate creativity to like the arts, but I think everyone has creativity in some sense, regardless of where you work. And so our mission is really, like we build foundational research and products and models and a lot of engineering things, but, but we're, we're a company devoted mostly to storytelling. And so we always think about it from that perspective. And the people who can tell stories are basically everyone in this room and everyone else, everyone in the world are storytellers in some way. We just haven't perhaps discovered the way of expressing those ideas. And so for us, it's really important to keep that in mind and not over obsess about the models. I've, I like discussing the technical aspects and the, the models and the, the compute and the data sets and everything else, but these are ultimately tools for like people to use. And the intentions behind those these people should be like prioritized over the intentions of the models. Um, so yeah, that's I guess how I like to think about it. Awesome, okay, I'm gonna open it up for questions right after I ask you guys a few lightning questions, which means like first word-ish answers and if you feel like you have to err, you know, let me know. Okay, what's overhyped? AI. <laughs> yes, any co traditional enterprise company that puts AI and press release out that they've added AI in the product. Underhyped. AI. Okay. <laughs> I think people tend to think of like, uh, is it zero one? It's like, it doesn't, doesn't work or like it will do everything and like will end the world. It's like the truth is like, these things have been working for like decades and years and there's a lot of things we need to like do more of, but taking extreme positions on it will not be helpful. So I think it's on there's their overhype and overhype. Big tech company you're bullish on because of AI. Uh, Nvidia, I think Nvidia is, yeah. That's the one I would think. Jensen is amazing. One startup you're super excited about that's not your own? Um, I don't think it's a startup, but uh, I came across the work of Asa Raskin recently. Uh, he's building like models to understand animals. The Earth Species Project. Yes, the Earth Species yeah. Project. If you haven't seen that, that, that's probably like, yeah, I would spend more time doing that. <laughs> amazing. I think I'm going to not say a company either, but I just think education and mental health and the companies that are really researchers that are really focused on solving those big problems. It's, you know, I really hate this Bing or Bard. Bing. It's tough to not go with Bing right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, innovation in the last, I was going to pick a period of time. I was like month, week, day, uh, week, month. Pick one. You're excited I mean, about plugins in uh, ChatGPT is pretty cool, right? Being able to see what you can actually do and make it useful and take action is, is pretty amazing. 
Gen That's 2. in the week. Seeing what people are doing with it is amazing. Okay, any questions? Because I will keep going. So f first, thank you for the amazing, exciting panel. And uh, forgive my ignorance here, so I'm asking for education, but my understanding from the copyright laws in the US is any content produced by Gen AI is not copyrightable. So if I'm gonna create a book using uh, Jasper or create a movie using Runway ML, I cannot copyright that movie. Is that right or wrong? I think things are changing a lot and a lot of laws and systems will need to change and adapt as well. I don't think we've, we've, anyone has the answer right now. I think this is just new. And so from our perspective, like our position is to like work with everyone to understand what needs to change. I think we're at the memo of change and it's yet unclear how things are gonna be defined, but we're, I, we're personally working towards making sure it's, it's safe and it's like usable for everyone, yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And as the application layer sitting on top of these models, I know the model providers are really working on this and, and trying to come up with the right answers. It's evolving every day. Um, we have included things like plagiarism detection and tools in the content to make sure that it's not directly pulling from somebody else's work. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's actually a pretty fascinating space. Hey. Um, Thank you for speaking to us. Uh, what's your name on the, what's your name? My name? Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris. Chris, thank you. Yeah, I thought what you said about like creativity was really beautiful and true. Um, and it feels like we might, feels like the AI tools might definitely allow, <clears throat> like you said, non, people we stereotype as like non-creative to be, to unleash creativity. But it also makes me think, you know, like web one or 2.0, it wasn't AI exactly right, but like algorithms, so Facebook and Netflix is what comes to mind for me. Like in theory, that technology, um, uh, well, I guess what I saw a lot of is uh, like you think about social media, like yeah, it allows people to be creative, but we also kind of end up gravitating towards this hive mind that can be really toxic and destructive when we are all reading the same stuff or we're in our own echo chambers and has really weird effects on policy probably and, and just like sort of like social stuff in general. So I guess my question is, do you think it's, do you think this will be different? Uh, how do we avoid that sort of fate? I think that, yeah, that, that technology was really cool for what it allowed, you know, it opened up a lot of different stuff, but I think there were a lot of harmful social effects. So I'm just wondering why, why, why I believe in what you were saying about creativity, but how do we get there or is it just inevitable at this point? Um, I think predicting the future is really hard. <laughs> and it's, I don't, I don't know and I think anyone who tells you that in five years and 10 years this will happen, like probably has no idea because it's just impossible. It's not, we can comprehend the future. We have to like invent it one step at a time. Uh, I think I, from our perspective and it's something I've been thinking a lot about is that we need to start putting like people at the center of like the revolution that's happening in this space and not over obsess about models. I think a common misconception is to, that you might see is that people tend to overemphasize how things are gonna change, the models themselves, everything else. But the truth is that people have been using this for years. Like, like in the movie, for example, like they've, they've been using our tools and not some other tools for a long time. And there's a lot of learnings already that are gained that if you listen enough and give more people the chance to like understand it, you'll under everyone will understand better what needs to change, what needs to be improved, everything else. Um, that's our approach. It's more a human creative center approach. Like, um, and so that's, that's how we like to think about it, but it's very hard to predict what will happen next because no one knows. If that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks everybody. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>